and then we will raise a notification on LinkedIn for anyone who would like to see it. And then the deck, uh, depending on the speaker, if they'd like to share the deck, then we'll publish it at the same time. OK, um, then these are the other user group meetings. So we've got, um, we've almost got nine meetings a month. We've got ins and outs of data modeling the first Monday of every month. We've got big data, data science, that's today, data privacy, data governance and ethics. So just to announce there that Costa will be holding what we call these couch coffee sessions where he will share some of the big challenges that happened. I'm sure you heard about all the interesting ethics challenges this week, this last weekend, and, and he will talk through it and just describe what the ethical challenges were with that, because I think we've come to the conclusion that doing ethics, you can't study a book. Um, I know lawyers do, and they, and they go through all that stuff, but I think for us, when we need to apply it to data and see how we go wrong and what we can do wrong and, and how we should operate. And then we have the African data management community that happens every Thursday. So those are our sessions. Um, and then just as a short introduction, this is what uh, today's chat will be about. It's going to be about four letter words. Champagne is far too long, um, but love your data and Yoda is, is the one that we're talking about. Liesl, thank you. Uh, wine is a four letter word. Ah. <laughs> And beer. And, <laughs> and beer. <laughs> These are all yours. Cool. Thank you, guys. Let me quickly share my screen. Um, so, can everyone see the purple? Yes. 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 Oh. yes. So, to the forum, I want to apologize. So, the title is Big Data and Data Science. Um, there was first an ask that I should perhaps share the journey of women in AI. It's a, a international organization I'm also affiliated with. But after some much thought, I thought I'm not going to give you answers today on how to do big data, how to do data science or AI or machine learning. I really just want to leave some pools of thoughts with you that's been Coming for a long time, I've been in data since 1998, truly, if I can classify it since that time. And during this whole tenure in the data journey, we have all the tech, we have all the solutions, we've got the Dama Dimbok, we've got all these esteemed um, people we engage with that writes books and gives us answers and directions. However, we still don't get data right. So I've been wondering now for some time, what is truly the blocker? And if it's big data or data science or plain analytics or it's reporting, the problem seems to be the same. So every research, let me just, oh, sorry. So I'm going to look away a few times. So every time research is done by Gardner, Forrester, or any other esteemed company, the topics and the themes are the same around what they struggle with. The CIOs, business, they all come up with the dreaded four-letter word. Some of us use the word um, with an F. I, I tend to use it quite often. The team have created an acronym, but it's more in Afrikaans, that F-O-K actually means fingers on keyboard. Um, so <laughs> we have to code, we have to engineer, and we have to solve quite a lot of problems for business. So if we look at this marketing chart that was released in March 2021, it summarizes quite a lot around how people feel about data. And they mainly interviewed marketing people, IT people, and tech people. And I would really, I don't see anything different. Data is not organized for easy consumption. Limited storage availability. Data analytics processes are too slow. So every time you read these type of things, it's not new. I don't know if Howard, maybe you and Drew, is anything new, because you guys have also been long in this data journey, is there anything new for you 
or surprise when you look at these graphs. No. So, and I, it's been bothering me now for some time. So the only thing I can truly think is that it's the human factor, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So when people say data is not organized to ease of consumption, so I think the constant challenge we have in data, we are actually quite a young capability, even though we've worked with data since the beginning of time, where astronauts and all our astrology people that looks at stars and that is all around data. We haven't really matured data properly. It's only coming to its full value and understanding and appreciation in the last five years, I would say. So data is not organized for easy consumption. It's all linked to the human factor. Why is it not organized? Who asked to get the data in what format? I have a little snippet story here is when I joined Standard Bank, we had to do a journey around big data and our data science community and our very esteemed advanced analytics people said, just give the data to me raw. I know data and I know how to work with it. So we set up the platform, we ingested the data raw and then for months and months after making the data available, the data scientists said they didn't understand the data. <laughs> um, so it's like, OK, but you're a data scientist. Um, you should play with the data, try and find trends with the data. Yeah, but I don't know what this field means. So because the community was used to working in a warehouse construct, where metadata was associated with it, was linked into a, a standard data model, so everyone knew that P underscore ID underscore number is personal people's ID number. If it's a B, then it means it's a business identification number. So if it's a C, it's a corporate identification. So people started understanding that. But as soon as they engage with big data, the data scientist was at a loss. So for months, what then happened was this type of scenario. We get into the blame game. The business blames and analytical community. I actually wanted to put shotguns up there. Um, but thought it might be a little bit too aggressive. Um, the analytical community blames IT or the date now known as the data engineering committee and the engineering committee says, oh, but business doesn't know what they want. So we constantly in this vicious circle. So my personal opinion, if you're working with analytics, data science, if you use a big data platform, a warehouse, a lake, a reservoir, whatever they now want to call it, um, it's mainly around us as humans that's causing all these disjoint concepts. Another bugbear that I have is we tend to call the same thing differently depending on the tech that you use. So Azure will call it Synapse Pools. AWS will call it something else. Or, Duke or Cloudera will call it something else. But can't we as a community just call it what it is to take away all the ambiguity around it? But anyway, so if I go back to the other slide, I can go into depth into each of them. But the main problem is we've have a failure to communicate and to communicate effectively between the people that need to collaborate on making data valuable. Second point, we don't have the ability to collaborate. We say we collaborate, but truly these people in this circle don't honestly collaborate. The challenge with that is business has got priorities, analytical communities got their own priorities, Data engineering's got their own priorities and it's not always aligned. So if we don't collaborate and have a single point that we're working towards from a strategy perspective, we will always be in this vicious circle and we'll always keep on getting frustrated and using short F words or four letter words associated with data. There's lots of complexity under the hood. I don't think the people actually understand the complexity that's associated with data, um, the concepts that's associated with data. It's not just a normal 
production system for customer setup and maintenance, and this is how you do it, and that's it. We've got so much complexity to deal with. We've got a warehouse, a lake, a reservoir, then technical metadata, business metadata, lineage, um, the FSDM models, the, the data models, logical, conceptual, it's very complicated. And I think we sometimes complicate it too much ourselves. Um, oh, I've skipped the one around insufficient documentation. The other thing that links me to the human factor is turnover in a company. People don't stay forever anymore in a company. And if we don't document the business rules and we don't capture the knowledge of that individual, as soon as they leave, that corporate is then back to square one because nothing is truly being documented effectively. We say we document and they write little comments in a code, but truly we don't give enough focus to that. So that for me is also another thing on why we don't get data right. The volumes and the variety of data that we're dealing with is increasing exponentially every day. And every day we think that that new data set will answer all our problems, but we can't even get the data that we currently have within your company right. We don't even monetize that properly. We don't value that properly. Um, and that's linking into the next bullet point. Data is truly undervalued. There is lots and lots of conversations around the one we had last week around um, how do we value data? Should data sit on the balance sheet? Where, where do we start to get data evaluated? The data is truly undervalued. I think from a, from a cost perspective, we think we understand how much data costs us. I don't think we truly do. The whole concept of ABC costing that the finance community has matured is perhaps a model that we as a data community should look at to see how we value data. Um, from a process perspective, the people that's involved, as well as the value that you truly derive from it. Um, I get quite frustrated, and that's also where another F word wants to come in, is when our marketing community says, but this campaign, we think we made six million out of it and so many customers, but they can't truly link it back to that customer. They can't tell me that that customer truly was linked to that campaign. Some campaigns we can, but not all, especially the billboard ones. Um, so there's a lot of thumb sucking. My other bug is that second bullet point, data is trying to be everything to everyone. I am not of the view that we should just take all the data from all the systems and dump it in a system like Hadoop or Cloudera or whatever big data solution you want to use and then see what we can make out of it. I truly think that we as a community need to help the analytical community and business to truly define the business case they want. This thing I want all the data is not going to fly anymore. It's too expensive. Especially with us going to cloud, and we don't really truly understand how much cloud is going to cost us. Cloud is going to help us to scale. Cloud is going to help to solve the problem where we don't have enough space. But do we truly understand how much a data is going to cost us? The ingress and egress costs, I think, is going to be a huge wake up call to a lot of people. That's why there is, you must maybe go and Google a little bit how many people in America is actually declouding, getting off cloud, because it's just too expensive to stay there. And then the last thing for me is on this blame game is the lack of data literacy. Everyone thinks they're a data specialist. Everyone thinks they understand data. But I don't think our community actually understands and appreciates that. And that's something we also have to get right in this little circle. Um, let me just see if I captured everything I wanted to capture. So guys, I talk very fast. So sometimes you might say half an hour, but I can do it quite, <laughs> quite fast. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to say under data literacy is just self-service frameworks. Business keeps on asking for self-service frameworks. Help me to be self-sufficient around how I use data and that. 
But if they don't understand data, if they don't understand the concepts around data, they can't truly become self-sufficient in using data. Um, but that's also a debate for another day. So let me just go down. So I want to just pause here with some comics and just see, can someone just help me and see if there's any questions in the chat? Um, I, I will I will answer, I will also actually stop you if there are questions, Lisa, so don't worry about this. <laughs> I haven't so, got anything from Esty. She's a little bit slack at the moment, but. Yeah, but I think uh, it's because I expected something else and I'm coming in <laughs> left field. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I've got a question, if that's okay. No metadata. Sure. There's no metadata, but that's a different issue. So, Lisa, back in the day, one of the biggest challenges we had is that very few people, maybe 5% in an organization, if that, were actually able of understanding even what analytics were and understanding how data worked and all of those good things. And I personally don't think that that has changed. No. So maybe the recipe that we need to be using to providing data, even to data scientists, there's probably has to be a lot more handholding, is my opinion. So, and I think, Drew, that's why I'm struggling with this concept, because we tend on wanting to ask how we should implement the tech and the data and how we must ingest and must it be real time and should we do trigger events and all that. But the bigger problem we, sh we need to solve for is for this, they call it data literacy, but the whole human value chain that's involved in data. Yeah. But I do think truly we're going to struggle for years to come, and it's great for us because it keeps us in a job, but I would really like to get a little bit better in data um, and not just keep on doing the same thing and keep on hearing the same statements and flipping research um, papers. I do honestly agree with you that <laughs> the analytical community especially, and bless your heart if you are on the call, I love you guys dearly, and I love business dearly, but they don't really know what answers they want, so if, and they don't know the question. So if they don't know the question, we cannot help make data, 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 in the old Standard Bank logo, simpler, better, faster. We can't, because everything we try, there's always going to be a problem, because we don't know what problem we're truly solving for. So if you if you work with people, because we've implemented self-service from a BI perspective, but the amount of complaints we get, my dashboard's not right, my dashboard's too slow, my and if you're going to the crux of it, haven't designed it properly, that you should still do a light model, even if you do a Power BI report, even if you do a click report, click um, sense or click, um, what was the old one? Click view. Yeah. It should still be some sort of data modeling behind it. Else your query will run long. Else you will always get different results and you tell me your code is exactly the same. Um, so, yeah. I agree with you. So if there is no further questions on, on just from my side and, and I, I it would be nice to hear from Don because he also spoke on, on a similar thing and it was a lot of it what Don presented was on the team that he built to achieve the level of analytics and um, yeah, and that was awesome. Yeah, I do feel that it's he he was very successful within a small team of people that knew the business. Uh, they most of them were, um, you know, uh, econometricians, and and their ability to work with the data and manipulate data was very high. And of course, it was nice to work with them because they understood the power of data. But that I think it does work in the small area. But when it scales and the separation starts happening, then I think we start to fall in the hole. Don, I don't know if you. I mean, you had a similar you had a similar presentation to what. Measles, oh. which is great. Sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. I think that's I think it's complementary. So um, I, you know, I, I share those sentiments. Basically, that uh, often there is appetite from users for for the, whatever you develop to be available in Excel, um, and um, so the challenge is how do you achieve all the the benefits of um, using um, 
of automation or of um, of using um, other other data platforms um, when you have to take it back to Excel. Um, and so what we what we did is at the bank was still do all the back end work um, uh, using using R or, or MATLAB or you know, other tools and then push the uh, present the content to users as if they uh, you know using Power BI or Excel um, to to make it to to lower the perceived uh, hurdles uh, for in, uh, interacting with um, you know with, with the solutions that have been developed of course this creates this doubles up the amount of work um, and creates um, other potential problems but there is a huge user resistance if you don't um, if, if there's a perception that that the change in the way of work is going to be too dramatic. Um, so that's a really difficult challenge because a lot of the benefit of using of of using a programmatic way of work um, is lost if you're going to take something back to Excel. But it's it's a it's going it's a common problem um, and yeah. something that I think you need to recognize that if you have if you have a lot of user resistance, um, then the, the whatever solution you develop won't be implemented. And I also think, Don, that the ratio perhaps in certain companies, because they are pockets of excellence where I'm working, but we don't get it federated throughout. Yeah. So the ratio around data engineers versus the amount of people doing analytics for me is also wrong, because if you truly want self-service as an analytical community, then the ratio should be the other way around, because then we as the engineers can do all the, the hard lifting um, for you, and then your data should become cleaner. You should be able to have a reconciliation between source and whichever data platform it landed in, and you can trust your data and you can work with it. But now that ratio is completely wrong. We're very, we're very thin on the engineering side, and I see it in other companies as well, and very heavy on the analytical side. But yeah, I can talk on that part for days <laughs> um, about the whole process around DevOps and ML Ops and Data Ops. Maybe we, that's also another thing we can talk about. Yeah, but, yeah we agree. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, also interested, we had a, just maybe you can help, we had a, we had, we've got a few people constantly asking about what are the costs of going into cloud? How do we estimate it? And I, I so enjoy your comments in terms of declouding because we just see the, the complexity and the, and the cost just running away from companies. And she almost brings the companies down. Yes, because what we now, our leadership has now actually realized that we're going to pay more for having solutions in the cloud. However, I think what, what we as a, a wider institution has um, not done right is we thought that there was only one lever for taking to the cloud, and that was cost. But it's actually not. So it's cost. We will be able to do the scaling. So if someone needs more data, it's not a three-month, six-month process, depending on how much more data space you need. It's quicker. So those type of things now also needs to come into the mix. So do I get data to my, to my community quicker? When we run out of space, can I spin up an environment quicker? You know, those type of things also need to go into the model. Right. Um, yeah, so it's not all about going to be cheaper. So it might cost more, but we might reach our customers quicker. We might be more um, effective and agile, I hope. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but we'll see We'll see how this journey goes. I'm, I'm quite nervous, especially in, in South Africa, around the data costs. Because yeah. not all the solutions we need in South Africa is in this region. Um, so some of it will still be in Ireland or wherever, and that 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 latency cost for me is going to be, yeah. yeah. So that keeps me up at night. But anyway, guys, I'm di <laughs> sorry, I'm digressing. So <laughs> <laughs> so just back to the to this whole concept around the human touch. So for me, data needs a special touch. It's very much like a relationship you're in but I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the relationship in another slide, is if we can't get the core right just for analytics, can you imagine the catastrophe? And I think most of you have seen some of the headlines around data science, machine learning, and AI. 
if we can't get the core right, we can't expect data science and those concepts to actually be effective. If we can just look some some of the embarrassing moments, if I can think about it, was IBM Watson. They had the oncology um, concept. They had to cancel that after a $62 million unsafe treatment recommendations. Wow. So the people blamed the IBM engineers, obviously. <laughs> they trained the software on a small number of hypothetical cancer patients and not real patient data. And it was, it was a disaster. So if they don't know how to work with data and they don't understand the core of data, that's the type of errors that will happen. Um, Microsoft's AI chatbot, chatbot was corrupted by Twitter trolls. It was very funny. Yeah. So they created this chatbot to try and um, engage in conversations. With, with, then, team, with younger, right? with the yes, with the, with, yeah, with the teen community. Yeah. Um, and then this whole Twitter trolls thing started, um, well, we can use the word spam, but attacking this bot. And it created anti-Semitic um, tweets, racist tweets. It was, it was a disaster. So they had to sh um, shut that thing off. Apple's 3, 3D I face ID concept, where um, the people created a 3D print of, a, of a, a face, and they just put eyeballs in it, and they actually thought that that was really a person. So there's, there's lots of things. So if you don't manage your data right, Data science, machine learning, AI can fail disastrously. Even Amazon with the AI um, uh, rec facial recognition categorized, I think it was 28 US Congress people to criminal mugshots. <laughs> and um, Michelle Obama was Seriously? one of them. That's probably it, was, <laughs> it was very funny. And um, Amazon also had to can the AI for recruitment because the engineers trained it to be strongly prejudiced against the female race. So guys, yeah, for me, if I can't mature just plain analytics in a corporate environment, I don't even want to start with AI and machine learning. I want to because I, I have a passion for it, but I don't think it would be wise. Um, so if I can go back to how do we then fall in love with your data? So I find it quite um, concerning when some of my people say data is boring. It's like, oh, how the hell did that happen? Um, I love data. And my statement to all of them is, love your data, you must. So I still want to create T-shirts for all of them, but just need to see <laughs> standard bank's going to improve that. So if you can allow me, I would I would really like to relate it to relationships. If you if you're in a romantic relationship, family relationship, friends, um, data is really very much in the same same stages. So there's an initial meeting or attraction if you see someone across the room. There's curiosity, there's interest. You get infatuated with it. Then you get this enlightenment moment and then the commitment part starts. So as an initial meeting, we as a data community must make sure we have all the people in that initial meeting to sell the dream of data and what data can do for them, so that we can then elicit what do they want to do with the data. So that requirement session is quite important. And this is where hope comes in, because in a relationship also, when you see someone across the room that you like when you're in your teens, or maybe now when you older and you're not in a relationship, is that that selling of the hope. So, you know, that person could perhaps be my soulmate, et cetera. But same with data. We sell the hope of what data can do for you. Then you, if you go into that curiosity and interest and infatuation phase, that's when you get to know each other. So that's where we have to play with the data, show business what we pick up, engage with them. Don't, they, they don't need to lock you up in the back of the room and say, go and do this and then give me the data. And then they're disappointed in quality and it's not what they wanted. They should be part of that, that whole process because that's how you, how you get to know someone in a relationship. And the same with data. That's how you get to know data. That's how you know what triggers made it do certain things. You understand the business process of your community. They understand your tech processes. 
Um, you understand how the data was created. So if you understand that, you know how to make certain assumptions with it. Because if you don't understand that, and you don't understand how your data was created and how it flowed through a value chain, you can't get the value out of it because you'll make very bad assumptions. Um, then you start negotiating on how this relationship could work, and then you negotiate with business on what is your minimal viable or minimal marketable product that you will present to them. And that's then how the whole enlightenment happened. So I, I am in a dream world around data. So, <laughs> so, and that's when the aha moment comes from business and go, okay, cool, this is actually what it can do, but I'd like to tweak it here and there. There's certain data quality issues because you will have data quality issues. It's, it's a, you, you just have to get, um, what do you call it? What's that in English? <coughs> accept it. <laughs> you just have to accept it. Same as in a relationship. No one is perfect. We have our flaws. And if it's full moon, we react differently when it's not full moon. The same with data. The data with certain processes, it can get corrupted during the whole value chain. So if you don't understand that, you will be sorely disappointed. So we as a data community have to really be embedded and entrenched with it and sell it to our business. Make them love their data because it's their data. It's not our data. So, yeah, so that's that one for me. And then the commitment where the commitment comes in is where people then are clear on what they want. How do they want to move forward? How much funding can I give to this data solution? What am I going to get back from it? Because it isn't like in a relationship. It's not just a one-way street. There's two people involved. So give and take. If I do this, I get this back. Because some people might not agree with that. <laughs> but the same with data. Whatever you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. Garbage in, garbage out. Um, if you expect certain results and you don't understand the process, you will be disappointed. So... I wanted to just close off with, regardless of where you are in the data value chain, if it's reporting, analytics, data science, machine learning, AI, business, give data your undivided attention, because then you will not be disappointed. You will understand fully where certain blockers will appear, where certain issues might come in, and you can manage around that. So we must get data literate, and we must try and drive that across the community because we cannot run before we crawl. You can't do proper data science. You can't do proper machine learning until you get familiar with your data. Um, so, yeah, in closing, all I want to say is love your data. You must. So, guys, that is me for today. Liesl, thank you. Thank you very much. There's one, there's lots of debates on the chat as to actually what y dash o dash d dash a stands for the acronym <laughs> uh, we're battling to type so your own data or your data or just love your data you must so for me when oh this was in 2014 well i'm a yoda fan so i just love this little dude he's the cutest little thing <laughs> you can find so in my previous company I was getting quite frustrated with the comments on your data is wrong, your data is wrong. And I'm like, no, guys, it's not my data. It's actually your data. I'm just presenting it to you. Okay. Yeah, so for me, it was your data. And this is quite a funny thing. You always think you come up with something unique. And then you go and Google it, and then there's like 10,000 other people that have this thing. <laughs> so we're actually not as unique as we think we might want to be. Because um, I see a lot of people have done other concepts around Yoda. But yeah, that was that was how I started with it. Thank you. Um, yeah. So now I'm open here for engagement and questions. And if you do have a big data or data science question, I'm happy to address that as well. Thank you, Liesl. Thank you very much. Um, anyone, if you just raise your hands, then I'll just uh, channel them. Or if you'd like to just ask, we, we don't have lots of pressure other than SD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just just me, lots of pressure me. So I'll, I'll raise my hand and then I'll ask. Go for it, you already raised your hand, you're virtual. Yes. Um, Liesl, how long do you 
Do you think if we educate a lot of people, do you think it'll help? Because I totally get where you're coming from. Um, I commented it in the chat as well. Like there's a lady that work, used to work with, with me that always said, you know, the tech is the easy part to solve. Like we can handle the tech part. It's the people part that is really challenging and difficult because like it's your data. No, it's your data. You own this. This is your fault somehow or somebody else's fault. Like where does that start how long does that take like i mean you're working at a huge organization like like where do you start where do you start with something that big so you see your it's it's the same thing as how long is a piece of string so i think <laughs> <laughs> what what i try now to do in meetings because i think it comes with my age i'm a, i'm really hurtful honestly <laughs> of the blame game and we're not getting forward and year after year we're just blaming each other so my first thing my first thing is leave your ego outside because if you bring your ego inside we cannot solve this problem if you want to do the blame game we cannot solve this problem i'm happy to off-site meet with them understand why they want to blame it or analytics or data engineering and i'll address it appropriately but in this meeting, you leave your ego aside mm -hmm. and we solve it. So then if we go through the value chain and explain the value chain of how this data works. Today, I had quite an interesting session. It took me three hours. But after that, the aha moment actually came in. So I think if we can start in little pockets and then those people that we've educated then becomes the, the mouthpiece for us also within business, it could I truly think in the bank I'm currently at, with about 5,000 people, we can solve it in 18 months. Oh, wow. But you can't have an ego. You can't constantly mm -hmm. work in this blame game, and you have to have skin in the game. This that you just throw a requirement over the wall and think if you say plant that tree, I'll know what tree, if it's a fruit tree, is it indigenous, not indigenous, what is it's gone. You have to have your skin in the game, else I'm not engaging with you. And if you cannot tell me what value you're going to get with it, I'm also not engaging. So I'm being quite, I'm getting quite aggressive, maybe assertive, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I think you can solve it if everyone's skin is in the game relatively quickly. The deep understanding around data, no, that's going to take time. Um, but just the appreciation around data, that I think we can solve quite quickly. Oh, and, Don, I like that one. Yeah, and, and maybe to support your, your comment, uh, Liesl, we've just come back from Saudi Arabia, and I, I don't know if you've heard about the, um, the data strategy for the country. Um, they call it Sabaya, which is actually the, the Saudi data and AI uh, Academy and authority, sorry. And this comes from the Crown Prince. He says, we will transform to data. We will make use of data. And and he separated data and AI, but that, I mean, we had lawyers on there learning about data, but it, it was tremendous to see them learning, and not always want to, but after a while they did enjoy it. <laughs> But, but it is that commitment and that single vision that helps people adjust and say, we've, we've got to make this change. Mm. I think I, everyone, and that's why it was a reason I joined this corporate, the people have it in their strategy that they want to use data and data is going to help the digitization journey. But I do think the lack of understanding and appreciation around data yeah. is not there. For me at this point, it just sounds like lip service because that's what the board wants. Um, so, so that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> we do need to um, <laughs> put a disclaimer on this, not my current employer's opinion. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I do think we all have good intentions, but we really have to understand it, appreciate it, and plan properly around it. It's like okay. what I'm trying to teach my team as well. It's okay to say no. If someone gives you a demand, you can say no. If they can't prove you the value, 
they can't link it to a strategic objective. We're not just doing it for the sake of that individual or that area's ego. It has to link all the way in the value chain. Else we're wasting our time, and then there's just um, shooting, blame game going around. And uh, Liesl, we, we had Drew's hand up for a brief second, and then there's one more question on the chat. Drew, is the you lowered your hand? Or? Yeah, I was just going to say to compliment uh, Liesl's yo, Yoda. Yo, yo. I love the local way of saying things. Yo, 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 yo. <laughs> Here's the data. <laughs> I'll try and do a rap thing next. <laughs> yeah. So then we have Patricia. He's from Ecuador, which is fantastic. He joined us last week. Welcome, Patricia. Okay. He's his question is how to support the creation of a chief, chief data officer position to strengthen diesel statement. That's a heavy one. So it, it depends, Patricia, what what your company strategy is, because that's also one of the challenges I feel that certain job titles are not aligned across companies or corporates or industries. So some people feel the chief data officer is all around just, and it depends on the maturity of the company as well. So sometimes it drives only governance and putting ownership, data ownership and those type of things in place. Then it will mature into monetization. So as soon as you have the governance, the appreciation, data ownership and those concepts in place, then the chief data officer becomes more focused on how to use data for the benefit of the company, creating more products, more services, monetizing data, and not necessarily from selling data, but what value do we drive out of data to service customers, et cetera, better? So, yo, Patricia, it's quite, it's, it, I can't answer it in five minutes, mm. but um, yeah, I, I, I think we could actually take that also as a topic. Yeah, I think that uh, that's very nice what you're saying, because that ties into what Peter Jackson and, and Carruthers were talking about in terms of almost those different generations of CDO. Where the mm. first generation was on structured on governments and governance and data management, and the second was on analytics, and the third one is this combination. And, and so they're monitoring how this position is changing. And it almost you, you as a as an individual, you need to choose the company that suits your strengths. Um, so they've got a nice so there's one other question uh, we have. Sarah is asking, what is your advice for a junior data analyst? And then Farron asked to add to Sarah's question, if you aren't finding a job, how else can you monetize your skills to make yourself more marketable? Sure. OK, so Sarah, for a junior data analyst, <laughs> one word, Yoda, love your data. Um, <laughs> I think Sarah, so as a data analyst, I would suggest you try and get close. I don't know if you, in what company you are and if you have tech leads and that type of constructs, but if you could ask your team, how do you guys get closer to your business? Um, there's a term that is used in corporate, like the product owner of the data. If you can get closer to that individual, understand what is their business problems, and then try and see how you can use data to solve that problem for them. But um, it's difficult because I also don't know what you mean by data analyst, because that's also different in different companies. Some, some yeah. use it as data modelers, some use it as source to target mappers. So, but Sarah, I, I mean, my details should be somewhere, but otherwise I'll just give you my info and you happy to have a chat with you. I, I do mentor people as well, so happy to just do that part for you. Um, to Sarah, okay, Farron, if you aren't finding a job, how else can you monetize your skills? Sure. So Farron, that's quite a hard one, especially in the in the economy we are now. But in a way, for me, if you could find a solution you can develop through a data engineering concept, if that is your passion around data. And you just post it on LinkedIn and you get people like us that's in the com community to help contribute to that. We'll share it, we like it, and we just spread it into the wider community. I'm sure we can help connect you to 
either companies or other solutions where you can find a job. But it's it's not easy, Ferry. Um, but I have seen with some of the people we mentor through the women in AI thing, we let them create little solutions using Pi, um, and we give them Raspberry Pis and stuff. We publish it on LinkedIn. We try and share it as much, and then they get connections and interests, either from universities that will then help them or from other companies. So, yeah, you know, it's not an easy one to answer, Farron, but you're also welcome to reach out to me and let's see how we can help you. And I, I think that that answer goes to the next one, which is Lelo. She's asking a similar thing on, on uh, getting that experience. I, I think your answer is valuable to both of them. Um, yeah, uh, so perhaps on that one also, what have you applied to like learnerships and stuff like that that companies offer, like graduate programs and learnerships? Um, yeah, but I, I think I, I'm happy to see what your skills are um, and to direct you into a, a path and then see how we connect you with companies that are looking, because it's definitely a domain that's lacking resources. So I can't make promises, but I can I can offer to help and see how we steer. And I think also just to add on to that, Liesl, thank you very much for that. Also, for other data management professionals that are employed but would want to improve their career, certainly this is the type of community where we're looking for people to talk. We're happy to almost guide you in presenting and presenting some information. So if you guys are interested in stretching yourselves, um, I'm still waiting for Esti's presentation. I think it'll be next week, <laughs> next month sometime. But so yes, guys, I think it's all about as, as a community and as people, let's stretch each other to grow in this area. And just coming back to the end of it is if you really enjoy data and you really enjoy working with it, it will shine, it will come through, and people will see it and recognize the, the, the passion and the skill that you have. So, Kiana Borja, you can contact me on my private email, then I'll send you the links for Women in AI. So then maybe I should do a presentation on what Women in AI is. Yeah, I think there's, there's quite a bit of demand there. That... Sorry. Okay. I just didn't feel it for today. That's okay. <laughs> Your data is also okay. I think we all need that. We never stopped the recording so early. So thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah.